because it, it keeps getting rejected. But I keep saying to myself, well, you know, the GBTC inflows at some point need to stop. They went pretty minimal this week, like 15 million the other day. Well, today they got today. They were like another 100 million, which was annoying. The, but the, they just just keep doing it. That's it's, it's finite. The president did say he thinks it's coming to a close or it's coming to a bottom mm -hmm. so right here. So Fidelity brought in four million bitwise, 11 million. And then mm -hmm. fucking Grayscale sold 125 million today. I mean, just did, let them just get it all. Just do it now. Rip the bandaid off. Yeah, literally. Let's just get just, it over with, right? Just rip the bandit off. This puppy wants to fly. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was telling um, I was telling Amit before we went live that uh yeah, if we're up around the eighty thousand dollar level, I think it's time to start scaling out for, for me for next week. If, if there's anybody holding crypto and you've been watching the Bitcoin dominance, you know, I think once we get up around that sixty percent, fifty five, sixty percent, I think it's time to start scaling out. So what, what do you think it feels like if once you sell that first Bitcoin that you've held on for oh, not for a years? Um, I think it'd just be a relief. Like I've been, look, this was, this was the plan all along. It just got slightly accelerated by a few years, you know, but this is why I am so, so unbelievably glad that I did all that damage to myself in 2020 and 2021, just investing because now I'm just essentially just sitting back waiting for my numbers. I've built a good runway. It's a it's a really cool position. I know I know I'm very fortunate. There's not a lot of people in the same position as me right now. So mm. it's good. Yeah, I know. Like a guy had to sell his house, had to move back home. It's 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 happening now. It's starting already. Why do you think it keeps getting rejected at seventy two? That's a good. Look question. at this guy's hair, dude. What? Who is this guy? Who I is know, this? I know. Yo, Sora is getting really good. That <laughs> almost looks like <laughs> some weird generative. I gotta fix my guy. hair, dude. You look, you look like someone Indian. I don't know who, but something. Well, you missed the white shirt, Memo. He would look like a. He would have looked like the bully from the nineteen fifties. Every nineteen fifties movie, like yes, this. Exactly. Exactly. Biff. Now yeah, you understand. Like right? back and all that shit. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's almost like your he girl's has coming hair, with me to homecoming. <laughs> Dude, I haven't seen the third one yet. I gotta watch the third back. Uh, uh, what up, Chris? How you doing, bro? Oh, uh, dude, my my lights just came back on. Like we had like a storm around us, and so the power went out. So the lights just came back up, maybe like five minutes ago. So yeah, what the? How was that whole business with the earthquake? Now you guys see what it's like living out here. Well, I'm in, in not in New York. I mean, I mean, I'll mean, might know, but no. Dude, it was, it was five seconds and my mom was terrified and I was like, that, that is right. nothing, you know, like, but she was like, oh my God. And they I didn't I, feel I, it out by in Atlanta. You're in Atlanta, right, Chris? They didn't feel it out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't feel anything. It was fine. Right. Have you, have you ever felt an earthquake, Chris? Or no? Yeah. There was actually a, he's like, yeah, my honey, it was a, my honeymoon <laughs> night, motherfuckers. They, uh, no, there was actually a <laughs> earthquake in New York. But it was like very minor. It didn't like last for more than like a few seconds. But I was on a platform on a train station. I was like, oh, this feels interesting. That's odd. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I remember yeah. like one other when I was a kid. But out here they get they get pretty gnarly. I got video I gotta show you guys that like a hundred gallons flew out of the pool one time from the what, from what's the longest you survived an earthquake? Like how many minutes or seconds? Like this one was half, literally five minute. seconds. No, they, they get pretty long out here. The aftershocks, the aftershocks are pretty long too. I would say, I don't know. I feel like 2018 or 2019, we had one that was that just lasted a while. Like I remember being back here working. I felt like my chair wasn't sitting in one spot, but the the ground was moving underneath me, which is a weird feeling. Like your chair is sitting and the thing is rolling. And then my wife and I called each other at the same time. I was like, "You feel that?" She's like, "I feel that." And then when I ran outside, all the doors were shaking, and then like 150 gallons flew out of the pool. I was like, "Oh shit, we gotta go inside." <laughs> like, and then it stopped. That was it. Someone's like Chris without a hat. I guess the market's about to take a dump. Right. If Chris, it's like the seeing your shadow, we get six more weeks yeah. of these fucking rates. Believe right. it or not, it, that, that might actually not be far away from the truth, but okay. Six more well, weeks. Let's, let's, let, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this market because this has been one of the most interesting weeks, I think, uh, in 2024. CPI, PPI came in hot. PPI today, not that hot. CPI, definitely hot. Market ate this dip like a fucking champ. They took up Nvidia at 838. They took up Robinhood at 1770. They took up Bro, the uh, Russell was Nvidia. down. The Russell was down like 2%. And then Nvidia, one single stock by itself was by up. Itself. 
like two three percent. It's it's insane. They, they they ate up Amazon's little dip to one eighty two all time highs. Apple five percent today. Nvidia above nine hundred. Uh, Tesla remaining like a champ above one seventy four. Um, bunch of other stocks. All the indices are up. I mean, it, today is really when it happened. Yesterday, like eh, the dip was bought. Today, it's like like around I think twelve p.m. The market was like, all right, we're buying. So how do we make sense of it? Because if we have more inflation, we're not going to get cuts for longer. So we'll start with you, Chris. Why do you think the market's buying up all these stocks? I mean, technically, we're seeing one green day, one red day, one green day, one red day. We're not really moving up. So I think we're going to see this, a little bit of a sideways action um, with maybe a possible downward swing a little bit going into uh, the rest of the year. I mean, most. Oh, thanks, dear. Yeah, most of. Give me one second, guys. Yeah. Cool. There you go. Now I got my lucky signature hat back on, so we're good. Whoa. Um, man, here we go. All is well with the world now. Now we're pumping. Now we're right, pumping. Yeah. Who was this guy? <laughs> <laughs> so I think overall we are in a sideways action. So if you look at just the volatility, it's been increasing based on like the data points that are coming out. But overall, I think a lot of the price targets that we saw in December have already been hit or or over already so i'd say we just have to be a little bit cautiously optimistic this is going to be a in my opinion this year is going to be a stock pickers market where you know you can't just rely on the ind index to basically save you you're going to have to be a little bit cautious know which which areas to hit and which areas to avoid you know and, and we'll see what happens carlos right. your thoughts on the, I think on the that's a good point uh, like a, that's a good way of, of framing the year. I just think we have a lot of things coming coming to a head. <clears throat> okay, we're not sure yet, but people are expecting. They're not expecting this rate cut in June. We typically do say the sell in May go away. So how how good would that really be? You know, I did. The, I, I went. Through, I went through the data. The last fifty years, stocks do perform better November to April than they do May to October. So how is that gonna? How how would that impact things if we suddenly uh, do get that first rate? rate cut in june but i think also you're seeing you i think it was you admit that posted like the the fear and greed index drop like a full box in like a day this to me is what i call the give me a reason market right like the party continues but give me a single reason to get the fuck out and i'm out right <clears throat> and i'm feeling like a lot of the money is going to the max the max seven that are already incredibly rich because it's the safest place right now so i feel like we're getting to we're getting a bit to use Chris's word frothy, and it's just a matter of what is going to be the the trigger. Because I I feel like people want to sell, but they need a reason to sell. They need a reason to justify it um, to the shareholders. So I don't know what it is because the, in, the earnings are still doing what they got to do, right? And companies are kind of boosting their EPS if they have to with buybacks. So we're in a really weird market right now and so I, I can agree with chris that the next six the next six months or so it's like you have to be you have to be a sniper you have to really find the right companies and sort of ignore what's happening around it because the macro can be um misleading yeah yeah go ahead chris no i was gonna say also you know i think and i i, I know i'm gonna get eviscerated for saying this but i think this inflation spike that we've seen the last couple of months I think it's transitory. All the I data so points. Too. I think so too, yeah. dude. I think you're right. Wait, say it again. Yeah. It's what? It's transitory. Right. You know, I'm seeing a, a lot of data points that just tells me one thing that there's lagging indicators that are finally going to start to show that we have significant price dis disinflation towards the middle of the year. That those lagging indicators won't show up in the data until the summer, which means that the Fed will have every reason to start cutting in the fourth quarter, well, late third quarter, early fourth quarter, and start the rate cut cycle there. But then again, the question that I am asking myself is usually when the Fed starts to cut rates, it's not usually good. That means that we're pretty much in a full blown broke recession something. at that point. You know, so uh, there's something broke. Yeah. Looking at the remaining Fed meetings. So you think September? I think September too, because I think yeah. the Fed doesn't have an obligation to cut until Something breaks and nothing's breaking, dude. Unemployment, at least perceptually. Well, look, fine. if it's not September, then the next meeting is the sixth, seventh, and we're not getting a cut then. And then they, they, the, the next meeting is the day after the election in, in uh, and, November. So they, yeah. So and well, I, I don't know. I don't know how you get a cut then. I, I I just don't think you'd get a cut around then. I could be wrong, but I think that's almost too late. Yeah, it would <clears> have to be before the election if you know. 
if it's so, you got to cut you got to cut november 6 7 you know all of the uh, <laughs> dude could you imagine all of the, you the market you know all the tax goes to 5400 the day you're supposed to vote for trump or biden it's gonna that's gonna be interesting dude and then imagine trump wins and then the market goes even higher because everyone's like okay he's gonna cut taxes and all this shit. you just can't <laughs> yeah. yeah i think i honestly i, I kind of think 2024 is gonna be pretty incredible and i think we're gonna have to deal with all this shit in 2025 but it's not like oh 2021's a great and we'll deal with it later because 2021 was bullshit great 2024 is legit great and these q1 earnings i think are gonna justify continuing to be great but eventually maybe we do have to deal with this or AI is so amazing. It is 1995 to 2000. We have five years of like this playing out. Yeah, but when you say we're eventually going to have to deal with it, what does that mean? I, I think that means, um, I think, yeah, well, I think that means unemployment rising to six, 7% and then rates having to be cut dramatically. Like basically what Chris is saying, historically, when rates get cut, it's recession time, right? Like companies can't put up earnings if people don't have jobs. And a lot, <laughs> and this should transitions us into the jobs topic. So Chris, what have you been seeing in the jobs market right now? Okay, so I'm high. I'm getting to the point where I'm I'm really really questioning the validity of the jobs data that we keep getting from the the federal government, where everyone's like, oh, there's this many job openings, there's this many you know positions unfilled, and I'm like, okay, great. That, let's, that post, let's... that post that you put up with that fucking fake ass recruiter guy, put, put, play that. Well, play yeah, it. that was freaking awful. I saw that like I don't know. Look at that are saying that they're urgently hiring but yet they're rejecting actually no they're not rejecting everyone they're simply not hiring i have to tell you this but these jobs don't exist i'm a tech recruiter um and i get ghosted by my company and other agencies we work for and positions we try to fill 90 percent of the time i'll have people get first round second round third round interviews even to the point where yeah they're going to figure out the financials and send them a job offer that doesn't happen there is no offer all they do is they're trying to make it look like they're busy and it looks like they're hiring. And then for whatever reason, at the end of the road, oh, it doesn't work out. I am literally being told now to don't worry about what hires I get. Just worry about hitting my numbers. So that means all they care about is me submitting resumes and that's it. There's definitely something political going on that they're not disclosing on why they are doing this to begin with. But yeah, it's a load of bullshit. Unless you're a rock star and you agree to get underpaid 20 grand, you're not getting an offer. What was your reaction to that? Chris will, will join in a second. Well, I, I mean, again, it it lends credence to the fact that a lot of the data that we're looking at is either old or completely inaccurate with a margin of error that almost makes it uh, useless, right? The other side of it is that a lot of what you're seeing anecdotally on platforms like X is probably a better indicator of what's really happening, right? Because you're right. getting the unfiltered information from the people that are on the ground. And a lot of these people posting this information are not guys like us that care about the stock. So this is not even like pump and dump. This is just people telling their story and we're using that information. But it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if people on those levels are doing everything they can to, to keep their jobs. Well, th this was an article that was published about a year ago. That's why I got signed off because I had to sign into a different account to mm -hmm. use my Wall Street Journal. But basically, the Wall Street Journal did this about a year ago, same time around March, mm -hmm. where they actually spoke about some of the reasons why companies are doing a lot of job openings, but never hirings. Some of them are actually very interesting. Like, so, so right here, right? Um, here's a couple of good examples. Close to half said that they kept ads uh, up to give the impression that the company was growing. You know, I mean, that's interesting, right? That the company say, oh yeah, we're still growing. And when VCs and everyone else, they look at job openings like, oh yeah, look, th these guys have posts for all these job open, that means that they must be growing. Right. And then a third of the managers said that they advertised job they weren't filling. They said to, uh, they kept listings up to placate overworked employees. So it's almost like, oh <laughs> like yeah, we're hiring people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like don't worry, we're gonna hire you know someone soon. But it's been like six yeah, yeah. months and they haven't hired anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. there's all sorts of nefarious things that can happen. And then at the same time, you know. Nowadays, it's so easy to create a job listing that you don't necessarily have a lot of friction there. All you have to do is go to Indeed. You you know you you basically yeah. open a thing. It's you have these pre-scripted things, and now you can use AI to filter candidates, right? Yeah. Which means that now what they can do is create an, a giant like pool of applicants that they can reach into to get the best 
person that's most qualified or fully qualified for that job. And then there was one other thing that um, that they mentioned um, that a lot of the jobs are like, if we get someone super, super good, we'll hire them. Otherwise we'll just keep the job opening uh, available, you know? So gotta, it's very interesting. I got to share this with you guys. This, I, I, By the way, I, I think, I think a lot of this stuff is very, <laughs> very job specific. I know that there are certain jobs that are very hard to fill right now, especially in the physical workspace, like engineers, plumbers, HVAC technicians, dude, they are, they're in such a high demand and there's just not a lot of people with those soft, those hard skills to do. And a lot of people, they're trying to look for remote jobs that pay the same amount. And it's like, no, you just, these are skilled trade jobs that require on the job training or apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th these are not positions that are going to get filled right away. And I think a lot of people were sold this idea that if you just go to college, you're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the guy who just went to an apprentice school, he's an idiot. And yeah. it's turning out that the entire equation was wrong. One it was of my, so wrong. Uh, it was dead wrong, dude. One of my, one of my, uh, one of my coworkers at my old hospital. He was a locksmith. He's not really my coworker. He's, he was a locksmith for the hospital, and on the side he ran a school for nothing but locksmithing. And he's like, you won't believe how much money I I tell people that they can make in doing locks, be, becoming a locksmith. Right. Look at how many doors there are in New York City. All you have to do is become a locksmith and you're almost guaranteed a six figure salary. No one wanted to do it. Why? Because they all just want to do remote jobs or they want to do something where they could sit in an office or or, you know, like they just felt like a lot of these jobs are scummy jobs. Like they're they're for like the lower class people. Mm -hmm. And it's such a stupid thing, man. And I think this entire new generation, you know, there's people complaining like, oh, I refuse to work more than 40 hours a week. Bro, you're in your fucking 20s. You're supposed to work 60 hours a week. I'm sorry. I was I had two jobs. Like I was I was telling my wife today, I had like I had my paychecks. Bro, I had paychecks with two jobs on them because that's what you have. You have time to hustle. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Check check this out. Just real quick on the resume thing. So this is a post I saw. I applied to 100 jobs using a resume. Kiss my D's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I got 29 interviews and it just talks to you about resume. So he's like, so you go through the resume and he's like, he's like, would you, you know, put your recruiter hat. Would you give this person an interview? And you're like, yeah, I guess so. But then he goes, look closer. <laughs> you guys. Oh, so this is so the interviews he got called this back. Is literally what he because of what Chris said. He he knows that no recruiter is actually reading it. If they do, they spend six seconds, and the rest of it's getting funneled through AI. Wow! So look, at, look, look at this. Let's just read some of this. Read some of this stuff. It's hilarious. Four twenty FPS on screen. A team implemented with a team of five engineers to launch three features within six months to provide a four hundred and twenty frames per second on screen experience with Lana Rhodes. <laughs> The points are for people that don't train know. Team after, trained team after achieving project goals on time and under budget by hosting orgies on Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> An orgy is group sex for those that don't know. Crafted two product requirement docs to scope and manage the launch of Facebook photos. Help utilize Google's computing resources to mine 15 million of Ethereum. <laughs> 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 <I'm returning it. laughs> these are great this is just awesome analyzed and created personal campaigns with only fans influence to increase brand awareness by 15 <laughs> percent. okay hold on hold on what if we what if we take the opposite side of this, this what if, give me give me the bull case for why unemployment stays below four percent going over the next two years people people are taking on more than one job no but like give me the reason why in a like for the next two years we have a legit economy where unemployment legit stays below 4% and AI legit propels us to incredible earnings. Because the bear case is unemployment goes up, Fed cuts rates, and then all goes to all goes to shit. But if the Fed only cuts rates because inflation's coming down and unemployment's not going up, that is the Goldilocks zone. Inflation doesn't go up, unemployment or inflation comes down, unemployment doesn't go up. Right. So the cutting of the rates is not bearish at that point. It's like just you just have to cut the rates because inflation's coming down. There's no need to keep it as restrictive, but it's not a response to unemployment. Is there a world, is my question, in the next two years where unemployment doesn't spike to six, seven percent? You know, I think there could be a world in which that happened. Now, the problem is AI is automating a lot of shit, so it's going to be hard. I, um, I, I don't think so, because <clears throat> I believe like we 
us might, might be looking at la lagging indicators. You really have to know the financial situation. Like most people say, even Dave Ramsey, he's like, have a three to six month, um, what does he call it? Uh, emergency fund. Emergency fund. So you got to get out of that emergency fund window to see how people are really doing. There's a bunch of people that are unemployed right now, but are sustaining themselves on either credit or savings. So we don't really know what the true economy is until those people have exhausted that avenue. And then you have to, then we'll see what the real data is. So I still think you need another, uh, say three to three to six months before we can really know. Um, but I don't personally see how we can stay like this, especially with the anecdotal evidence that we're seeing online, that it can be this disconnected from like the actual financial data and us and unemployment not eventually break this. Hmm. That's my take. I don't know how long it's going to be, but I just can't see this going on another year as normal unemployment staying at around three, three and a half, almost 4%. And, like and by the way, and we're you got to do something about you. You California people got to do something about your stupid government, man. I Bro. mean, you keep raising the minimum wage and then the prices dude, of shit increases. Dude, McDonald's, and then what do you do? Did you, you see the big at the 20, 20 McNuggets at McDonald's is a... Uh, or 40 McNuggets is $25. To, to right. me, to, to me, I think it's political cover for the eventual automation, right? They're going to say we had no choice but to do this because we just can't sustain these rates. They're going to actually be able to show that, that customers are going there less and less. I think, I don't know if we talked about this, but McDonald's is actually showing weakness in that target audience, the, the under $45,000 a year household. So I just don't see how these, these prices are sustainable because almost all of them just passed that right along to us. They literally just raised the prices, right? <clears throat> how is that sustainable? The problem yeah. is you guys do it in California and then some of these other stupid states, they get the idea, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe we should do the same thing. Oh. And then they screw up their economy and then everyone fucking flees to the rest of the to the to the um the rest of the country and they bring their stupid political and ideologies and down there. And it's just it, it's like mental retardation just follows these people. You know, it's like, it's also hey, just, let's keep voting. Yeah, sorry, it's just, go ahead. It's just like the fast food workers because, like, there's other jobs, like office jobs that you would consider good, good office, like white collar jobs that now pay less than what it is to just go out and flip burgers. I mean, look, the, the market has a way of punishing people when you go, go, Antith antithetical to like what's required by the by the market you know i mean i understand people have to make a living wage but here's the thing the interests in california are so weird that they're aligned to the existing incumbent rich people like i told you the happiest per people in california are people who own their own homes right scot-free and they have a super low property mortgage they've been living there for the last 30 years and so they did a documentary about like building additional housing in California. And you just saw all these old white boomers come mm. to these meetings like, no, 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 you can't build anymore. That'll destroy the character of the neighborhood. You know, we would rather have yeah. a tent, a tent camp with like hundreds of people than build new housing, you know, and the amount of money that California, I think, what did they spend? They spent $20 billion over the last five years for to to create housing and they can't account for majority of the money well, like it just like five, went they, to all these ngos yeah well, when they, when they, yeah exactly yeah the money was stolen but if you average it out it's something like five hundred and fifty thousand dollars per house yeah i mean and these are small these are not you know these are like a little adus um it's yeah, it's, it's a little it's, it's getting a little it's getting a little <laughs> ridiculous out here yeah it is what it is man i'm just getting to the point where i think a lot of the policies that california and new york comes up with they they really screw themselves over and then they bring a lot of those policies to the rest of the country and it ends up screwing us over too like new york with this whole no bail no bail like no cash bail people yeah. are just going out here committing crimes the crime rate is oh, like did you see super the combination high. of that's that stupid thing the no bail and the and california being lax did you see that now they passed the bill, I think, in the House that the community can sue a company if they leave without giving six months notice. So if you're, say, Walmart, because I think a Walgreens just closed, right? I think in Oakland. So now that it closed, people have a hard time getting their prescription medicine or supermarkets closed. It becomes harder for people to get their food. And they close somewhat just quickly because they just can't handle it from all the theft. Now they're saying that the, the, the stores need to give them a six month heads up that they're going to be getting rid of the supermarket when the reason they're getting with the supermarket is the actual community they're looking to serve is robbing from them. This is, it's just getting ridiculous. There's you know, so you know, many, you can actually you know see what the other problem is, dude, people, my age, 
don't want to talk about this stuff. So when I was in New Orleans and we were at the breakfast mm -hmm. the brunch or whatever, and I kind of brought up politics, mm -hmm. this one girl was like, oh, we're not talking about politics. And I just looked at her like, why? She probably doesn't <laughs> even know why she's saying that. It's probably just because that's the thing. We don't talk about She's politics. like, let's avoid that topic. I'm like, but like, so what are we going to talk about here? Like, like we're all mid twenties. Like we should, these are discussions we should, but then you realize like, us and people in the chat care about this stuff. The vast majority of people don't care. So then they are voting for stupid shit like what Chris is talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Most, here's the thing. Most people even my age don't want to talk about it, which, oh, is, true. which is what's true. scary. Because I feel like one of the best things of just being involved in a community of investors over the years is there's just like en energy and information that comes through you through osmosis, right? And if you don't have that, then you are literally just on your own. Yeah, and, uh, it's something that, that, that one, one of the sad parts is I, I will hear this in the comment section too. Like, oh, yeah, you guys are you talking too much about politics, and I'm like, you do realize that politics and investing are intertwined now more than ever, right? Yeah. Where literally political decisions reverberate into economic issues and economic problems. Like, here's an example: this no cash bail thing is really wreaking havoc around the country in certain jurisdictions. And so now you have all these dollar source closing, right? Because they're like, we have a theft problem. We have a crime problem. So even though technically dollar general and all these other things, they have nothing to do with politics per se, the policies that were adopted end up screwing these people over. California yep. instituting this middle, um, this, um, this living wage as they call it ends up causing higher levels of inflation and if that bleeds into the rest of the economy california is one of the largest economies we have in the country you know they're a significant portion of the contributor of the gdp to this country so if they end up he count its gpd against countries it ranks yeah up. so when you think about it if they end up increasing minimum wage that means that rest of the country's wages are likely to follow suit eventually too so it's just one of those things that you have to you have to talk about these things as an investor and keep your eye on it. Like, here's another thing that I actually spoke about this on a, on our, um, on a Patreon, um, post, you know, right now, I don't know if you guys know the Ukrainians, they use drones to bomb some Russian oil facilities. And you know who got mad? Biden. The Americans, Biden, yeah. Biden and the administration. They're like, how dare you do that? Because you're causing global instability of oil. <laughs> and it's like, what? And so the they're, try they're trying to win a war. And Biden's giving them all the money to win the war. And then at the same time, Biden's like, yeah, but you can't go that far. Yeah, because you'll that's cause inflation. Yeah, and that, inflation that's, that's is bad. Like, yeah, that, that's political posturing. <laughs> S same thing with Israel and Iran right now, where is normally the U.S. is all about Israel. We're, we're behind you 110%. You know, but now, now that there's likely, to, if there is a kinetic war, the oil prices will shoot up, which means that now inflation will shoot up. So... The U.S. has been like, hey, Israel, you know, maybe we oh, calm down a little bit. Maybe right. we have a little bit of cease power, you know. Talk it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it, it's one of those things that because it's an election year, no one wants to be no one wants to be that guy that caused problems during an election year. I mean, Biden's already like in the on the ropes with a lot of policies. You know, Dude, did so, you see? Did you want to be a party? Right. No, you don't want to be the guy. All right. <laughs> oh, no, we got to watch this. Did you guys see? Um, What's this? Did you guys see? Uh, you said Biden's on the ropes. Did you see Trump at oh, Chick Fil A? Trump at Chick Fil A in Atlanta. Like, oh, she was like, "I love you." a bunch of Oh, Dude, they were giving him hugs. They were saying, "Fuck the media. We love you." Biden has never had that type of appeal, just in like going out to get you know lunch or something at a local yeah. Chick Fil A. Trump's getting love in Atlanta. This is know? what I'm saying. Yeah. The data we're looking at is is old. You got to look at what's on the ground. Doesn't look like uh, it doesn't look like they're telling us. <laughs> well, it's whatever the case is, it be this being a political and uh, an election year, because you know there it's also remember about like. The, the House and the Senate too. It's not just the presidency. So it, it's very, it's very difficult to talk about these things, but it's also one of those things that we have to remember that there's actually no good sides either. And I'm going to say something critical about Republicans too, because I think both sides deserve some criticism. Um, 
one of the Republican, I think, uh, I think he's a member of the House or the Senate. I forgot which one. But basically, they had a legislation on the table with regards to like a bill to help with the border crisis, right? To actually enforce some of the laws and regulations and stuff. And basically, the 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 Republican like. I don't want to say Republican machine, but the Republican machine kind of told him, hey, no, we want this crisis to keep going for another year. Yeah. Well, that's what they did with Merrick Garland as well. They didn't let Merrick Garland get in because they want. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. it serves it serves the purpose. Now, here's the thing. On one hand, the Republicans are like the border is an issue. The border is a problem. But they're actually not trying to fix it because it's an election year yeah. and you kind of yeah. want this destabilized problem. So it goes to show that people give more shit about the party's politics and getting power than actually doing the right thing. That's, that's the fucking sad part. And I think that's the problem with both parties right now. So unfortunately me being who I am, I, I, I am trying to distance myself from like, okay, who's right and who's wrong. And instead just figure out which, policies are going to be making me money and which policies are going to prevent me from making money. So, you know, the policies that make me money invest in those sectors and industries and companies that are going to benefit and stay away from the ones that are on the opposite end of that. You know, that is my feet. Go ahead, Carlos. Real quick, I, I don't think it's possible to get through an election year and and feel good about your vote, like to say, yes, everything that I want, I at least have my voice heard that I'm supporting it. There's going to be a give and take uh, with anything. So you're right. I think that's the way to look at it is like, look, what's going to help me over the next few years? Because as we've seen now at any minute, some sort of black swan event can just come in, pull the rug out from under everybody. And basically everybody's then on their own. Right. So I think the lesson to take away is really set yourself up <laughs> because when, when the shit does hit the fan, uh, no one's coming to save you. Yeah. I think I decided a couple of years ago that if you're a human being who wants to live a happy life and make money, actually caring about politics, like being invested in it, it's a, it's a waste of time. You need to know about it, but like having a sort of ideological, like, oh my God, the Democrats, Republicans, it's like, that's what Chris said. Figure out what policies make you money, invest in those sectors, maybe invest in those candidates and move on with your life. And this is what the Olin pod, I think does a really good job talking about this. Chamath had that really good speech in 2017 at Stanford where he was like, the goal in life is to get the money. When you get the money, you have the power. When you have the power, you can have influence. Everything else is a game of, of, of bullshit at the end yeah. of it. Yeah. Okay, let's react to this. Uh, so uh, Adam Newman, uh, I thought this was a hilarious clip. Four minutes of him talking about his new startup. Uh, very interesting answer says the questions on how he's going to build this new real estate startup. So just let's react to that, talk about it, and then we'll, we'll move on to something else. Do it like 1.5. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. To see you. Thanks for welcoming us here for launch day. Um, you're launching your new venture today, Flo. I know that you've been heads down over the last few years just concentrating on developing it. I want to get into it. I want to get into WeWork, which I know you're trying to buy back. But first, I thought we might just address the elephant in the room. Some people might be surprised to see you on our screens again. What are you going to do differently this time around? Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming down here to Flo for Lauderdale. Do like 1.5. I think it's like 1.7. We built a global brand. We had over 10,000 employees that were so passionate. We helped redefine a category, and every single thing we did had to do almost anything and everything with community. I am the kind of person that actually learns more from their mistakes than from their successes. So all the great things we did in the past, we're going to do again. But then I had time to reflect. For example, partners. I'm so grateful and lucky to have Mark Andreessen and Ben Horwitz from A16Z as my partners. For those of you who don't know, they both come to my board meetings, and our boardroom is exciting. And for those of you who don't know them, they speak their mind if you want them to or if you don't. So there's more debate in the boardroom than there was before. Debate is an understatement. There are lively discussions that can go all over the place. They're also a great partnership themselves. It could be them and me. They and hold us. you more accountable? Everyone's holding everyone more accountable. And I have the pleasure to working with them, and they are entrepreneurs. This is actually their third business. So it's one thing to have investors who are giving advice. It's another thing to have entrepreneurs who you consider peers that are working with you. That's one example. The other one is something you just said. I've taken my time. We did not rush. We did not rush to launch this brand. Mm -hmm. We've been running this business for the past two years. We built our operating systems. Mm -hmm. We built our technology back end and front end. We rebuilt processes. We rebuilt a property management company. And we did all of that to practice and test and see what works right. and what doesn't. And even before we launched the brand, this building that you're in now is 95% full. Other Florida location is 96% full. And that was before the brand. Right. So I want to get into flow and this business model. Your mission, I'm going to read from your website, revolutionize the residential experience as a virtually integrated, vertically integrated real estate owner, operator, and technology innovator. What does that mean? So I'm not sure where you read that in the website, but it's, it's actually more about coming to your higher self between you and yourself. Your neighbor. <laughs> okay, so that was, that was, <laughs> just a couple more seconds of it. I hate to say this, but this is the same pitch that I got for Audia, by the way. All right. <laughs> the exact exactly. same thing, bro. It we was all philosophy, dude. 
Ah, and I was no like, numbers. Oh, okay, how nice. much money? I believe in this. So she's going to press shit. him on this real estate thing, and he's going to keep talking about like the philosophy of it. You can talk philosophy when you've got numbers, but when you don't have numbers, it kind of sounds. You know, when I say that about Carp, you have a hissy fit. No, but Carp has numbers behind him. Uh, yeah. numbers. That's different. Carp has numbers. Carving together, what you read, I think, is from the bio, which is a little bit of what we're doing. Bio will explain. Is that accurate, though? Are you a real estate owner, operator, and technology innovator? Extremely accurate. So, Flow is an experienced first residential real estate company. We're vertically integrated. So, we have technology, we have operations, and we have uh, the people that bring it all together. Also, as you can see around you, design is a very important aspect of what we do. And by bringing all of these things together, we had a theory two years ago that the buildings will become more valuable. In both of our Florida properties, we're already starting to show that with much higher performance. Are the buildings more valuable than when you bought them? So, more valuable. Now we're asking a real estate question of capex. Yeah. But if you're asking if the buildings have a higher NOI, net operating income, okay. than when we bought them, this building you're sitting in has a 40% higher NOI than when we took over 18 months ago. And does that mean that you've increased rents, rent growth? Growth, which is also a metric important a, in the that's industry. That's a great question. We also increase rent growth, but some of your viewers might say, oh, Miami's rent growth are up. So actually, Fort Lauderdale, where we're at, rent has gone down 8% in the past 12 months. So we've increased our rent, but also we lower churn. When people like being in a building, when they actually feel like they're part of a community, they stay. When people stay and there's no churn in the building, it increases occupancy and increases the value. But that's just one So example. just to be clear, you are increasing value, and that's reflected in the value of the real estate that you own? So I'm going to answer it very precisely. Another lesson. I'm going to answer it very precisely. We've increased the net operating income of the building you're sitting in by over 40% since we took over 18 months ago. If you want to say what it's worth, that's a question a for people metric. who buy. It's a different metric, but NOI is how we're measuring it okay. and, the, and the value of the building. You only know, by the way, what a building is worth is when you sell it. Okay, so so the thing that I thought interesting is he's building an apartment complex. He raised $350 million. The startup's worth a billion bucks. It's almost like WeWork, which was office uh, real estate licensing, but they called it a tech company, which is why it got so overvalued. What do you think he could possibly do to make this apartment complex uh, a sense of a higher self, which would increase the value of the startup? Are, are they building these buildings? No, they have the buildings. They're renting them out. But the idea is communal living. So people will live together. And his argument is these buildings will become more valuable. The rents will go up if people feel like they're in a community, which to me, it just okay, feels like so, an apartment so complex. It so does, it does work, by the way. The, the business model is sound. But... You have to be very, you have to be very, how do I say it? You have to be very generous with how you do it. So here's an example. And this is something anecdotal that I heard with people were doing in Miami, right? So imagine you have a three bed, two bath condo, right? Now, the thing is, it's a pretty large condo that you have. What you can do is essentially, instead of having one person rent it out for, let's say $3,000, you can charge each person fifteen hundred, and now your thing just went from three thousand to forty five hundred. You see how your NOI went up because now you're basically just splitting the apartment <laughs> between three people. Mm. So it, it's kind of it's not a it's not like oh my god this is like a unique thing that they're doing. This is actually a product that's done everywhere else. The difference is I think with a lot of younger people they have this thing where they don't want to do a lot of maintenance. They don't want to do a lot of like cleaning. And so they can kind of do a more tailored experience where they have like a housekeeper come in and clean the general area, right? Where all the person has to do is just maintain their own living quarters. Everything else is basically done, right? Then you have all the amenities that come with living in like a luxury building. And if you could do that for like 1500, you're fine. Most people, especially now the demographics are shifting towards people staying single for longer people people are attracted by uh, prospects like that so I think it's a I think it's a play on a demographic shift where people are not buying into the housing market as quickly because they've already been priced out so where are they gonna be looking they're gonna be looking for you know opportunities where they can basically live and the thing is now unlike in the past where you would have to go out there and find your own roommates like let's say right now me you and me you and Amit, We'd actually have to like each other. We have to find each other. We have to trust each other. And then we get into a commitment to be in the apartment for like a year or two, right? But the thing is, one of us would have would take on the risk of that lease. So let's say Amit says, you know what? I don't want to be here anymore. He leaves. Now me and Carlos, we would be stuck with paying the lease for two people. And then we'd have to find a third person, right? So these guys, what they would do is they would just kind of like, you know, filter, filter through their algorithms to find like the best candidates that would match the other two people. And instead of renting it out based on like, you know, one apartment, they just rent it out to each individual and that they would just handle their, their, their tenant individually. 
you well, know, is, people are doing this. I mean, even back when I lived in New York 10 years ago, my girlfriend at the time was doing that. She had moved into an apartment, same sort of deal. It was four bedrooms. Somebody had been living there for a while and they continued to rent out the other rooms to other people as, and then as you would, as people would move out, you would move up and get a better and better room till eventually my girlfriend was the only one left and she got the big room and did, ended up doing the same thing. Effectively, what she was able to do is get her rent down to several hundred dollars, which is insane. If you think about it, like, you know, late 2009 to 2014, paying three or four hundred dollars to live right there and, you know, in the East Village. It's crazy. So it sounds like they're just doing what people have been doing anyway and eliminating that risk from the, the people that are doing it from having to carry carry the rent. But also, I, I'm there, sorry, I don't see how that's like a one billion dollar business model. I don't see how that's technology. Like, if he's talking to me, to me about how these buildings, when you're in there, there's this incredible, almost like a 15 minute city experience because of the technology that they have. That'd be something different. But it really does not sound like there's anything innovative in what he's doing. I mean, am I am I wrong? No. I, there's also another factor in it. Also, so you know, there's there's a gap between long-term rentals and short-term rentals that could theoretically be be filled. So here's an example. Right now, Carlos, if you wanted to, you know, if you had a job and you needed to be there for six months, right? Like let's say somewhere in New York City. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to go out there and get, live in a hotel for six months? No, right? I'm probably, it's I'm probably doing prohibitive. Yeah. Right? Now here's the thing. Even if you did an Airbnb, how many Airbnb people are going to let you stay for six months at a time, very few, because then you would get tenancy rights and all this other shit, right? Well, you also have so, to negotiate rates. For sure. Right, and then most of the people that end up being landlords, they're not gonna wanna do a six month and then have another two months the apartment being vacant. So the thing is, it, it's hard to find people that'll do a six month lease. So these guys could end up providing shorter lease terms as well. So you're seeing this right here where, um, this is a company that's doing the same same thing in New York City called Rumor, where basically you would have like an apartment like this, it's like seventeen fifty. It's in the west side of Manhattan. Um, let me just close this and show the other the actual apartment. Share. So this is like a communal living space. So it's three bedrooms, two baths, right? Yeah. Now no, you would tra travel yeah. nurses, travel nurses. right. Yeah. Travel nurses would be yeah. big. So right now you would get occupancy in one of these rooms and it could be for a flexible rate. So instead of 12 months, you could do three months or you could do four. And based on the based on the amount of stay, I think the prices could vary like seven months. So if your contract is only six months, you could stay for six months, you know, and basically do the do it that way. So I I think there is an unmet need. And I think this guy sees it and he's trying to capitalize on it, but who knows? I, I think it's too small to like base a business on because you're right. And look, I dated a travel nurse, so I know what that was like every six months. She either had to renew or go live somewhere else, right? But I don't know if that's a big enough market to, to start a business on. And the other part of it is this. It's kind of like when remember how they were talking about extending the rates, uh, the, the terms mm -hmm. of mortgages. Hey, let's make it 40 years. So you're still at the same payment. It's kind of like masking it to make it look like it's a better deal than it is because ultimately they are making more money off of the same thing. You are getting less, less square footage for your rent. That's ultimately what it comes down to. And the reason is because the, none of those individuals can afford an apartment on their own. You see what I'm saying? Like it's to me, it's kicking the can down the curb. They're kicking the can down the uh, down the road. Yeah. The other the other thing is these apartments typically come furnished, right? So this way you're not buying everything. Mm -hmm. You're basically getting a furnished room as well. So you're not That's dealing staged. with the hassle of move moving and right, all the right. other stuff as well. Right. So like I said, there is an unmet need. Um, the 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 key here is going to be making sure that the numbers work out. Because I mean. If you look at if you look at why WeWork failed, their biggest challenge was they were leasing, you know, leasing long term, but then doing leases for short individuals term. or business right. short term. So this could be very similar in that regard too, where they want to grow really fast. So instead of buying the real estate out outright, because that requires a shit ton of capital, mm -hmm. what they might be doing is saying, look, we will just lease the entire building. Like they build a brand new building. We lease it out for, let's say, five years. So the developer is going to get his money mm -hmm. every year. He yep. gets his return, right? 
And now what these guys do is they come in, they put in the furniture and they start, you know, renting out each room individually and providing the services individually. And they make the money on the spread between the two. Yeah. So that's the only way that I can see the NOI growing. Um, other than that, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'm not it, sure. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense that yeah. like on paper, I can see why, but is it a billion dollar company? I don't know. It's already a billion dollar <laughs> it could company. Be more. It could be more. It could be a lot more. I mean, if he if he pulls this off, dude, and he yeah, comes if he pulls back. it off, you got to give him. Yeah, you got to give him some. Props. In 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 this day and age, I think with the prospect of remote work, with the prospect of you know how transitory some of these jobs are, because I mean, look look at the jobs that we're seeing right now, right? I mean, we're not looking at a lot of full time job creation. We're seeing a lot of part time job creation, which means that these are not stable jobs. You know, there's a lot of contract and gig work out there as well. So how do you how do you contend with that? You know, this is this could be an optimal way. And like I said, I think younger the younger demographic is they're okay they, with yeah, coming they're more, to tolerant, they're more tolerant of that, and they're more tolerant yeah. tolerant of that in bigger cities because that happened anyway. Yeah. It was just now I don't, do it officially through the building. And a lot of them don't have a choice either. That's the other thing too, mm. because when you're like 22 years old, this is your first job. You don't really have a lot of credit history. That's very seven, very it, few it, landlords uh, yeah. are willing to take a chance on you. Because they know you're going to be a little bit more of a risk than someone who's more established with a job for the last five years, so on and so forth. So I'll be, I'll be right back. Yeah. Um, gold, Chris. Any thoughts on this breaking out? Is it kind of geopolitically we should be a little worried about the state of the dollar because of this? I don't know, man. I mean, <laughs> gold, gold it's up thirty percent in six months, dude. Gold doesn't move like that. Like, gold is supposed to be an inflation hedge traditionally, so you know people are people are assuming maybe higher rate of inflation going forward being the standard, and so they're just like, look, I want to, I I am not confident in the market, and I just want to. There's still a lot of gold bugs out there. You know, like this guy, Peter Schiff. Do you know who Peter Schiff is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's over the moon because it's up 30%. He's happy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but this is the thing. Like, he's taking a victory lap after how many years of underperformance? You know, so, yeah, like a decade. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. The, the, the point is, some markets are purely based on speculation, not necessarily based on um, any real tangible supply and demand dynamics. I mean, technically, I, I shouldn't say that about gold, but, you know, it's there. Um, yeah, I think commodity prices overall are higher right now. So people are just going into precious metals as an inflation hedge. So they're getting bit up, but I don't know. I don't know. Okay, I know you're long this one and you've been long for a while. All-time high, officially here, 189. On Amazon, V-shaped recovery from 180 in 2021 down to 85, back up to 189. Um, does this one have more room to run or is this? Yes, sir. It's going to keep doing its thing, man. Amazon's business is very secular. Cloud is growing. Their advertising business is growing. They're generating cash flow like there's no tomorrow. Jassy is just doing his thing. Amazon is no risk, baby. This is like, if you want to hold a company long-term, Amazon's the way to go. You know. Okay. I'm putting the StreamYard link if anyone wants to join as well. Yeah. Um. You guys can join. Yeah, I think the Amazon thing was very interesting today. It's up 23% year to date. Um, Meta got upgraded to 600 by Piper Sandler. I, I think, it, you know, I didn't think these companies have more room to run. Meta's up 50%. Amazon's up 23%. But if they crush earnings, dude. These are just giant ATMs, I it. They're just ATMs that keep compounding. That's it. You know? It's crazy how we've made all these weird ETFs over the past four years. And like the NASDAQ, that's it. That's really all you had to worry about. Yeah. The the only thing that might be a problem for some of the max. I like that to so called Amazon and Google has top two positions. So shout out to him nice. as well. So some the main problems that you would see with Amazon and even Meta is that a lot of their recent profitability is thanks to cuts. So cutting jobs, cutting office space, cutting excess spend. So that this way the business becomes more profitable and they could use that additional profit to buy back shares and boost up the share price and EPS. The thing is, if a recession does happen, how are these companies going to be impacted? I think, in my opinion, Amazon 
Meta, Google, they're very insulated against a lot of recessionary impacts. I mean, people are still going to be using AWS. People are still going to be using Google Cloud. People are still going to be, you know, conversing on Instagram and buying ad space on Instagram. So these are just cash flowing businesses that just compound on themselves. So I, I don't see any material weakness. The only thing that I, I see is the prospect of legislators thinking that this is a great piggy bank that we can once in a while knock on and get some money out of them. We can shake, shake, we can do some shakedowns and get money out of them. You know, like, I don't know if you know, like, if you look at how the regulators do it, they're like, we're going to find this company for this, for this practice, blah, blah, blah. And, and just, and it's just like, oh, these guys make so much money. We're just going to issue them parking tickets once in a while, but these parking tickets will end up giving us like a billion dollars or something. I mean, if you see some of these fines, it got yeah. crazy, you know. I think Meta and Amazon, Carlos, we're talking about Amazon getting to all-time highs again. Crazy, right? They, they just don't care. It, it, it's AI, uh, the, what you call it, um, AWS. <clears throat> it, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to bet against them, right? Uh, this one, we also got to talk about this one. Uh, Apple jumped 5% today. Yeah, what was the deal with that? I was looking at, I was wondering like, what the fuck? I think the market just needed them to say something and then just <laughs> M4 and they were like, all right, fine. All right, the M4, yeah. But have we heard anything? No, no, I guess it's too early. I guess it's too early. M4 so. chips in the max uh, end of this year, they'll be released. I mean, look, the new chips are great, but it's like, I don't know if that's going to really increase revenues and growth is the Apple's biggest problem. But this thing, I guess, got oversold. Oh, but it's NVIDIA. <laughs> it is. I mean, yeah. Well, people keep forgetting about Apple. They just generate so much freaking cash yeah. and they just keep buying back shares, dude. Like this is this is one of those businesses that you know that they're going to have cash flow, even if their top line is not growing as much. The amount of money that they're just committing to share buybacks means that this, this company still has a lot of room for upside. It's like, yeah, so. it's like an infinite money hack. You know, I'm <laughs> telling you, these companies, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, they've right. got the infinite money hack. But that's what I'm saying. At a certain point, is that not hiding <laughs> the true economy? If we're yes, just looking at, is. We're just looking at yes. earnings per share because all the money is going to people that have shares, right? All the money that they're generating, all of that wealth is going to people like us that own shares in the company. That's the only place the money's going. So, Well, also index funds. Remember, all the people who would like, oh, my God, I'm doing so well and because of my index fund. Yeah, because your goddamn index fund is 50% mag 7. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. All buying, the, right. Yeah, all dumping their money in, yeah. Did you did you guys see the EPS growth numbers for um, 2020, um, 2024? Hold on. Let me let me no. look at this EPS. If While you you're look doing at that, EPS growth, yeah. Carlos, like, are you using this thing or no? What? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm arguably, yes, I am using it. I am using it less. I've just been a little bit more busy. But some of the some of the apps, there's some there's some cool apps that are get out there. The updates have been pretty cool. Um, is it still a replacement for any one of my existing products? No. Okay. But I feel well, like we got. We got someone backstage, so Chris, hold off on your thing, and we'll have this guy come up in the yeah. we'll do We need that app, man. Oh, he's also named Chris. Oh, yeah, my name's right. Christian, but I abbreviated it just for this call. Okay, I love it. So, yeah. So, um, where where are you from, and how long have you been watching the pod? So, I'm from Chicago. I've been watching the pod for I'd say about a year now. Oh, I think wow. I stumbled upon your stuff, Amit. I Great. think you represent oh, no. like the retail investing community, so. Just wants to say dumb money. The dumb <laughs> money. I was gonna say, I was gonna say the degenerates have a have a lease. <laughs> no, but yeah, just wanted to say uh, I love the pod, I love all the insight that y'all provide. But I did want to just come on here and just ask a question. Like, this is not financial advice, right? But I just wanted to hear from your perspective, especially like you, Chris, and Carlos, who are a little bit more like older. I say you guys are both what like 30s. How yeah. did you thanks? Yeah. Appreciate that. Yep. Yep. Late thirties, but yep. I'll I'll take I'll take it. Yeah. I'm celebrating it almost ten years out of my thirties. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I just wanted to know, like, how did your investment strategy change as you got older? Like, did you would you say that you took on greater risk as you were younger, but then as you got older, maybe you started, you know. Taking nope, risk. both these motherfuckers started taking on more risk as they he got crypto and spreads. They both got riskier as they got older. Mm -mm. I, I think the risk is the risk is proportional to the amount of money that you have to spend. Okay, right. So I wasn't making as much when I first started investing. I also, if you guys know, if you know the story, the the, the platform that I was using forced me to like schedule my trades once a week. So I was much more of like a dividend investor in that sense, where it was like the money coming in every single week, just invest, right? 
I'd say a little bit in my thirties leading into my forties when I was like, Why, what the fuck? I got to start sniping some of these, right? Like I'm hearing all about these companies. I should be invested in these. So for me, that's what it was. As I made more money and, and had a little more experience, I got more comfortable taking more risk. Okay. I'd say I went from relying on other people's input to doing my own input. I'd say that has been my biggest transformation because in the past I would watch YouTube videos and I would watch like the other, other content creators. And, you know, like I try mm -hmm. to understand the logic, which they were applying and then say, Oh yeah, they make a reasoned argument. Um, and then based on that, I would invest. And then I realized that at some point that not everything that they were saying was logical. So I said, okay, you know what? I will do my own homework and the parts that they are actually right about, I'll know. And the parts that they're wrong about, I'll call them out on, you know, or not really call them out publicly, but, you know, just avoid them and, and do my own thing. And I found, and I found certain strategies that work for me. I realized that good due diligence and understanding capital structures really helps a lot when you come to, when it comes to investing, because it also gives you this comfort in the back of your brain and you're not relying on someone else's conviction. You develop the conviction yourself. You know, so there's a huge difference between being able to hold a stock because some guy on YouTube said it versus you doing the homework yourself and being able to understand why the company is doing what it's doing and basically using after that, using some common sense. And yeah, and hopefully, hopefully this is something that everyone eventually develops and figures out for themselves also to say, you know what, my risk appetite is X. So I need to do is this much homework. And once I do the homework, then I need to allocate capital in, in that, in that way. So, and let, and let me say yeah. one thing about Chris and Carlos as well, both of them, you know, they've studied markets for a long time. Like they both took pretty outsized bets, Chris on like a Celsius, right? Carlos on like a Bitcoin. Most people don't do that ever. Most people will never put their money in one stock, much less options on a stock or something as, you know, whatever as Bitcoin, right? Something as fake as Bitcoin or something, but they both really studied those things to be able to do it. So I don't really think it's about your age. I think it's about like, do you actually believe in the options on Celsius or the Bitcoin thesis in 2020? And then, you know, how much risk are you willing to take? Yeah, you, all, you, you also have to really commit yourself to like, I know a lot of people really want to just get like the picks from people and be like, oh, just tell me what I should buy. And it's like, yeah, it's not as, it's not as simple as that because everyone's, First of all, when someone says that to me, I, I have to ask them, okay, first, what age are you? Because if you're at a younger age, you shouldn't be you, you should be taking more risk than someone who's in their 50s. So if they're in their 50s, they're like, oh, I only have $100,000 saved for retirement. I'm like, bro, you, you got some problems coming your way because you can't take risks. So that means that you need to be in safety. So you need to make some adjustments in your lifestyle rather than trying to go up on the risk thing. Then there's also tax treatment. Like there are people that live outside the U.S. versus people that live in the U.S. that have way different tax consequences of buying and selling and also how much money you're making. Like if you live in California and you're a doctor, you're, you should be investing a different way than someone who's, <clears throat> you know, living, I don't know, living in a state like Florida and basically have like $60,000 of income coming in because that means that most of your money or the gains that you're going to have, especially if you do short term, are going to go to taxes. So like I said, it, 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 investing is not necessarily just about, um, especially if you're trading. It's not just a, it, it's not just about um, um, like what's a good stock. It's also about your own personal risk tolerance, but then also your personal life situation as well, and where you are, where you reside. A lot of these things can get really complicated, and this is where you need to have like a a personal finance person actually go through the stuff with you. So you know, don't don't. Um, have a good accountant and have a good lawyer. They, they'll pay, they pay, they pay themselves basically. They'll pay themselves. How old are you? And what are your three largest positions? Yeah. So I'm 23 and I'm going to be real. I'm all in on Tesla right now because oh, let's wait, fucking go. I like that answer. What did you, what did you, what you, hold on, hold on. When you, okay. So yeah. When did yeah, you buy in? And when like, when I want to land at 414. No, my, um, my, my, um, so my first purchase of Tesla was back in 2019, but I sold. No, I sold way too early. Me too. Me like, too. I, I managed to lose money with my purchase back then, but I was I was 19. Like, give me a break. Right. That's fine. <laughs> but, that's fine. But my yeah, current I mean, average, like, I bought back in like I DCA for like the past year, so my average is like 200. So not it's not terrible. It's not. 
It's not great. Do you have like a do you have a a, a decent job where you take a lot of money? Yeah, from that? yeah. I have a four hundred one k set up. I, I I went to college. Did my did um. What would you get your degree in? I did actuarial science. So. Oh, so you were you are you are you an actuary? Yeah. So, oh, so that, that's yeah. a good paying job. That's a good paying career. Okay, yeah, so so you take the money out of your paycheck and you put it all into tax. I, I'm actually I'm actually you're an actuary and you're like oh go all in, oh, go all in on fucking Tesla like that's, that's exact. Well, I feel like I'm. My you're a terrible job is, actuary. I'm just no, not gonna say no, it's actuary oh, ever, dude. Opposite, right? Like my job is already too conservative. It's like all right, that's let me facts. Give, let me more risk. Right. That's facts. <laughs> for, but, so for yeah. so explain in a nutshell for those that don't know what an actuary is. What do you do every day? We manage use, risk. Yeah, exactly. So we use probability and statistical theory to manage risk, and it's very applicable applicable in insurance. Investing, obviously. Yeah. Oh, you must be crotching it on Tinder. <laughs> 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 Based on your age, sex. No, okay. So, so, so we got one more person backstage. But before you leave, why Tesla? What's your thesis on? Okay. Well, I just think the transition to electric vehicle, electric vehicles, is inevitable, and then they have they have all that stuff going on with robotics. Um, yeah, Chris, it's, he's it's got a five year, he's it's got a five year thesis, and Chris, I appreciate right. you. I think, I appreciate I think long term you're gonna be fine. Very I stuff. think long term you're gonna be fine. Yeah. I think long term yeah. you're gonna be fine. Just yeah, love it, man. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. See you later. All right, we have Mark cares. If he's what does here, Mark care about? His 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 picture. I bet you the dude's just gonna turn on the light and it's gonna be a giant dick flopping yeah, around. Okay, all right, no, 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 no. <laughs> right in our face. His picture just froze. He must have. Uh... Yeah, Mark cares. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's gonna. He's gonna probably have to reload. Yeah, yeah. Mark might have to reload. You guys been buying anything? I, mean, I, I bought a little bit of Robin and a little bit of Pouncers. Okay, here he is. Here you go. What's up, Mark? Hey. Not much. So I'm North Carolina, and I've been watching you guys for almost a year. Okay, Mark, be so, honest. Make it under that robe. <laughs> be honest. Be honest. Just tell me. I've got the up. tidy whities on. Is, like, is, don't you feel like Mark's about to just go to the moon? <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold no, on. Hold on. So, flash. Before you say your question, who do you uh, who do you resonate with most? Are you a Pounder dude? Are you a Tesla Bitcoin dude? Are you a REIT? Yeah, you're Pounder dude. Who are you? Who do you resonate with on the pod? <laughs> Palantir. There we go. Oh, God. That is, is this is what Palantir people do, right? He's naked. There's probably peanut butter right out of frame. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Just balls. Mark, thanks for joining. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Yeah, so about a year ago when uh, First Republic out of New York crashed and SoFi tanked, I started searching, like, what the hell's going on? Found you guys. And started throwing money into SoFi. So I want to thank you guys. You kind of give me a a, a new perspective. Just kind of think outside my box and uh, give me more confidence in my trades. So okay. and investments. Or or just wanted to say what's up. No, I just wanted to say thank you. So okay, so let's let's ask yeah. let's ask you some questions. So what's your largest position right now? Uh, SoFi. And do you have a decent average on that one? Under uh it's about seven uh seventy five. Okay, that's okay. That's decent. And then the second largest is Palantir. Yes. Okay. Uh, I've got about an average of nineteen. Okay. So not too bad. So these are relatively these are relatively new companies to be invested. Did you just start investing? Like within the last No, I started uh uh investing uh i worked in the oil field back about 10 years ago invested in that but when covid hit i was just looking for you know i just got into growth stocks and with robin hood and everything cost of investment tr trades came down so you, are, are you retired and then, or do you still work no i yeah i work for uh i'm a layout guy for construction i be a field engineer basically my mistakes are set in stone so. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. All right, man. Thank you for joining. Means a lot. Thank you for tuning into the pod every day. Yep. You're welcome. And I'll tune into you guys uh, tomorrow. Take yeah, care. Yeah. Sounds good. Bye. Take Thank care, Mark. You. Yep. Crazy. All right. We got someone else uh, who's here. Felipe, what's up? Oh, shit. I don't know why, but my AirPods aren't working. But, uh, we hear you just fine. We can hear you. We can, we hear, can hear you. you. Yeah, you're well, good. I have, I'm, yeah. I'm literally like outside, so I can't even like. I have to like use my mic here. Okay. All right, whatever, dude. It's all good. Uh, I feel like you're now, gonna... I just I always watch I always watch you guys. I watch Emit for a long time and I'm like, what what the fuck is going on? You guys are streaming? How do I join this? 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, how uh, how long have you been watching Finance Junkies? A while now? Uh, probably a year. Probably a year for sure. Okay, and what's your where where, where are you right now? Where are you? Oh, I'm in. It's, I live in. Awesome. So I'm originally from Canada, Toronto, but I actually mm -hmm. live in Thailand. So like Ooh, I'm in Bangkok. Nice. So this is like insane nice. Bangkok right now. Why do you Why did you go to Thailand? Was it for cost of living or a job or? Yeah, like I started a couple online businesses. Did the whole digital nomad thing like before COVID. Like I moved out here in 2017, 2016. Oh, perfect. Nice. Okay. Yeah, dude, Southeast you? Asia is awesome for, <laughs> for growth. If you look at Southeast Asia, there, there's so many, so much development, so much industry that's coming over there. It's it's crazy. So yeah, I think you're you're right in the middle of the next growth um mm -hmm. growth prospect. Like yeah, a lot of people don't give credit to Vietnam to yeah. um to thailand malaysia yeah. indonesia they're growing really really rapidly so yeah I've, if you're looking at the local economies they're going to do very well yeah i've visited all all the countries you just spoke about i visited like i just always i always got i always got a good feeling in thailand but yeah i spent time in all those places and they're all growing i honestly like have like i really think like not to shit on you know the west or anything but like north america i feel like it's seen its best days i mean i grew up in canada I, I think America is doing better than Canada, but I'm very happy with my decision. What is your What is your biggest your passport? Your passport, bro. I have three. You have you're, <laughs> you're a triple passport, bro. This guy's traveling. I got, I got lucky. Felipe, my Felipe wants, he wants a wife in every country. How old are you, Felipe? I'm 34. Okay, and are you single or are you? Married? Yeah, I'm single. Okay, and what's your biggest position? Uh, Palantir for sure. So what, I what? actually bought, I actually bought Palantir on the, like when it first went public, Okay, perfect. like the first, first week I put 10 grand, it ran up to like 40. And I was like, holy shit, this is sick. And then it dumped and I just kept buying. So now I think I have 4,000, I have like around 4,000 shares. I love it. But I want to, my goal is to have around 10,000. And what's your average on Palantir? Uh, I think right now it's around 16, 17. Okay, not bad, not bad at all. Yeah. yeah. All right. One thing, one thing a lot of people may not know: the Thai bot has actually been pretty strong compared to a lot of the other currencies for the last ten years. Thai bots do. How did okay. you know that currency of Thailand, Chris? How do you know this shit? Because he's know? a fucking G, bro. The guy's fucking smart as fuck. <laughs> the Thai no, bot. Just, like, what the fuck is the Thai bot? That's a currency over there, man. What do you want? You know, no. It, the point is, there's a lot of countries where the currency is weakening significantly, but the Thai bot's actually holding up pretty strong. So if you look at like Japan, Japan has devalued almost 50%, but Thai, the Thai, Thai bot has been between what, 30 and 36? Something like yeah, that? It's like, for it's like, like the 36. Time. It's like 36 yeah. for a dollar right now. Yeah, All and right. same thing with same thing with Vietnam. Vietnam, a lot of industry is moving there. A lot of offshoring out of China is moving to Thailand and Vietnam. So yeah. yeah All right. So I got a I got a question though. Okay, sure. Go sure. ahead. Next question. We got a couple in the back. So the people in the back just hold up. And I'm then, like, go ahead. I got like a third of my net worth in Bitcoin. Oh boy. And I was wondering what you thought about that. I know Chris <laughs> isn't gonna like that. Wait, but is it? Uh, is no, it, no, is okay. it hold on. Are you? Do you have? Are you up on it, or did you just put? Oh it yeah, in? yeah. I'm up. I'm up. I'm up for sure. When when were you buying? Sorry? When were you buying? I was buying about a year ago at twenty five. All right. So you're you're up like a you're up hundred percent. Yeah, I'm 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 up hundred percent and I just don't know. I don't know if I should just like sell some of it and put it into the market or, or just it's it's a really weird time with the having coming up, you know. I was curious about your thoughts. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, and I were talking about this a little bit before we went live. It, it, Bitcoin has a way of wrecking everybody, right? So once the yeah. long, the shorts, everybody's wrecked, then Bitcoin does what it's supposed to do. I think everyone's expecting this massive rally leading into the halving. There's some of the, right. there's some like technical reasons why we're not getting it when I mean, you just have a right. certain amount of outflows per day. <clears throat> but I personally, I think I, I'm in the Benjamin Cowan camp that I'm really following the Bitcoin dominance. And I think yes. one going to be, I'm going to be very technical on this yeah, run yeah. in a way that I wasn't last time. So once that yeah. Bitcoin dominance gets that 60%, I'm definitely going to start unloading by position. Yeah, that's then, that's so funny, bro. bro you, say, you say that because I literally, because I think it's at like 50 right now, right? 55, Around? 55, right. So what we're basically looking for is Bitcoin to become 60% of all of crypto. At that point, you say, okay. A pullback is is an, is inevitable because there's simply no more liquidity left in the in the altcoin market for Bitcoin to usurp. 
And so that's at least for me. And I do believe that we are so, going to, we're on track to be seeing that somewhere around next week, somewhere around the having. So, so your theory is, okay, so like Bitcoin dominance, the price is going to go up, right? So a lot more people are going to buy Bitcoin. And then once that it's reaches the top, people, people rotate into alts, which basically decreases the dominance of Bitcoin. And that's when you're going to exit. Well, no, no, you, essentially, essentially people are buying Bitcoin, but they're also converting altcoins to Bitcoin. So okay. Bitcoin is getting liquidity from those from two places. Once Bitcoin hits around 60% of the total dominance of the crypto market, that's when you typically see pullbacks. And that's when I'm expecting to start scaling out because it's right. fucking okay. 60%. That's when we that's when we expect that the profit taking from Bitcoin will trickle down to the okay. to the altcoins. But that Carl, could be a while, right? I'm not sitting around waiting for that. Do you okay, my my next question. I know the last question. I know there's a lot of people waiting. Carlos, so like I understand you're gonna like DCA out. Are you gonna con are you gonna hold a percentage of Bitcoin? Or are you gonna plan to get completely out until like like when that happens? Okay, my, my personal belief is that this is probably the last time we're gonna see any real sort of multiple as a result of the having. I don't think the havings are gonna have any real effect after this point. And so okay. for me, for me, I'm waiting for 150, anywhere between 150 and 250 thousand as like yeah. the peak price this quarter. But I don't think it's gonna happen right now. Is what I'm saying. But in the meantime, yeah. I need to relieve some pressure so I can actually hold. Because if you're holding, sitting on all those gains, it's going to be really hard to hold if it passes 100 on its way to, you know, to 200. It's very difficult. So for yeah. me, I'm looking at the metrics in the way that I, I'm just going to follow it and respect the metrics. Bitcoin dominance is 60%. I start to scale out of the position, and then I wait for uh, either market cap or price targets. Yeah, and that's that, where I, I feel. I feel like a lot of people screw up. It's like they look at their bag, they look at their amount, and they're like, "I'm going to sell when I have X amount of dollars." But you should yeah. be looking at the technicals, like what you're saying. Oh, no. so it doesn't and, matter and, how much you have. Yes, and for me, in this cycle, I will be completely out of big, of crypto, all of it, every oh, bit of it. Shit. Out, really? Bit. Yes, because okay. he's dumping it on dumb money, dude. It's gone, and I, and because I know that we're going to get a, we're going to get that ninety percent, eighty percent drop. And I need to have that right. money invested in markets so that I can build a bigger cash position to buy back in and have one of those like Bitcoin for life positions after this. But again, that's just me, you. financial advice. No, no, no. I, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm probably going to keep a little bit, but I'm kind of aligned with you. I, I was looking at the Bitcoin dominance too, bro. I appreciate it. Believe me, if you follow me, if you follow me on Twitter, you will know when I sell. <laughs> trust, trust me. Okay, also, 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 <laughs> con also consider right now that Thailand right now you guys are going through disinflation like there's no tomorrow which means your federal funds rate is going to get cut so a lot of your investments in Thai Thailand you might want to convert to US dollars uh, and put I it into some good dividend I all of my investments in US man all of my investments good. in the US good. So all right. I got to so interact you're ahead with of your broker's curve. account yeah nice. it's all so you're ahead of the curve. I keep all my money in okay. US okay nice. cool well thanks for right, thank you bro thank you man you do one more take care appreciate it see you later see you okay Thomas, Thomas, is he there? Whoever's left, bring everybody on because. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thomas Landon, what's Woo! up? What is up? Oh my God. We have been usurped. Yo, Thomas, yeah. are you the Thomas that's always in my morning open? No, I'm Smokey. I'm Smokey. Oh, I'm you're Smokey. See me. I, I've, I've, you know, I'm a lurker. I'm a lurker. <laughs> okay, all right. So let's 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 start. Thomas, uh, how old are you? How long have you been watching? What's your biggest position? And then we'll do the same with Landon. Go ahead. All right. I'm 19. All right. Okay, it looks like under it. a year, under a year investing. I've been watching this show for like maybe three months. Okay. Biggest position, Palantir. Obviously. Okay, there we go. Okay, Landon. You're, you're there. Not looking good for the next generation. Landon, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh I'm 29, almost 30. And I've been watching the channel for about two years now. Um and Biggest position is in Palantir. <laughs> <laughs> we know who's the who has it's influence like on the a, podcast like now. Dude. It literally is like a, this is like a Yo, and Chris's entire Patreon is just like mad as hell right now. These fucking idiots right now. Okay, so Thomas, okay. we'll start off with your question. Go ahead. Okay, all right. Listen. Okay, so my parents have. I don't know if you guys struggle with this, but I cannot get them to basically understand the concept of investing like just like chris said like if you only got a hundred thousand for retirement like you're screwed like they don't know what's coming and i'm trying to like get them to understand that they need to have a plan basically sell right. their house and buy bitcoin and they'll thank you and, and if that's you what i'm telling they they do they will not listen to me no no but but no no no, no. <laughs> no i'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. house but thomas hold on your parents um 
they don't care about investing. That that's the issue. They're scared. They're scared. They're they're they were programmed to throw your money in a bank account. Don't touch it. You right. know what I mean. So, so they have, know, they want to know which Michael Saylor video we need to send to your parents. So they, they have money in like a Bank of America collecting nothing, basically. Yeah, like right. You're saying, yeah, exactly. hey, at least put it into like something right. getting five. I mean, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like the S P, you know what I mean? Like but when, okay. when you talk to them about investing, I'm sure they're they're happy to know that you're thinking about these things at night. Yes, yes, so, yes, yes. Okay, so when you ask them these questions, what do they say is like their plan? Just hold it in cash. They don't really have one. They don't. They, that's the thing. Like, I just got my mom to put sixty five hundred into her Roth IRA for twenty twenty three, and like, I'm like, you need to build out every week. Like, you need to be in bed. Like, you, like, so you're not screwed. Like, it's either going to be harder now or harder later. Okay, Chris. How, how old would are you? They? How would you tell how them? How old to are they? Uh, forty eight. Forty eight. They still. They still got some time. They, that's so. what I'm telling them. That they're not totally screwed yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would sell. I would say, look, mom and dad. You know. I'm not saying go all in on it. First of all, you should you should only talk to them about index funds. Oh yeah, yeah especially yeah, yeah. safe index funds because otherwise, I mean, I I'm of the mind that you shouldn't try to change people's minds if they're against it and they've done okay in their life. That's fine. I would recommend instead. Why don't you just worry about your own situation going mm -hmm. forward? And then this way, once you start making the gains, they will come to you saying, "Wait a second, how do you have so much money?" Right. What did you do? And so they'll have confidence. So no, no, right this, now, is a, this is actually this is actually a true story. Yeah. I, Thomas, I've been dealing with this. My parents just started Robinhood and investing in Roth IRA, all this stuff, and they did it because I showed them some gains, right? And they're right. like, I "So you got to do your work over the next couple of years, and you know, if you do yeah. well, I think your parents will get because that's the only way to motivate them, in my opinion. That's the only way, right? Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yep. I wouldn't yep. tell them to put it into Bitcoin. It's too volatile. No, I no, I, yeah. right, right, Ethereum. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, well, real, real quick, Thomas, what, what uh, are you in college right now? No, I'm, at, I'm an HVAC tech. Nice. Is, oh, good. So Congrats, man. So I, you are guy. I do HVAC, uh, like nice. uh, you know, heating and cooling. Okay. Perfect. Nice. Congrats, man. You're, you're smarter than most, most uh, yeah. teenagers. Don't... 33. You're gonna, dude. So many people are loading up on student loans. You're gonna oh yeah, I'm, money. I'm complete. Your, your job is secure. You're gonna yep. be and job what, secure. And what, what state are you in? Maryland. Maryland. Where? Oh, Maryland. Maryland. Yeah. Ocean All right, City. Landon, what's up? Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, just quit my job of 10 years, was in the real estate grind, new construction real estate specifically. Um, did a lot of real estate investing, coaching, uh, a lot of the short-term rental game. Um, built up a really good portfolio and basically quit the nine to five work in a sales office and sell new homes all day and just full-time traveling now um been building a portfolio for about the past seven years and caught palantir my average on its 750 at oh that's great three three hundred fifty thousand dollar you know Dang. entry level um wait so you have three hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of pounder at seven bucks that was your average yes seven, so that's worth a lot more than 350 right now then right no current current oh, the, price is 350 it, it, entry it, level was a seven so um yeah the, the the last basically that i got in it at robin hood at about 10 13 um and now that Great. I have a decent, uh, so there I got a good position so far and then got into ARC uh, right as it started um, when it came an ETF and I'm up like 80% on that ETF as well. So uh, wow. the I've started dabbling into the option game and it's uh for someone who's a very dopaminergic human that is and the way that robin what word did it use what dop dopaminergic i got a lot of dopamine in my brain i like okay. yeah I, I like the feeling of, of winning of winning. Of you, got, you got you got you got michael jordan syndrome man right. you know what michael yeah, jordan's yeah. problem was yeah, he wasn't it he wasn't a yeah he, he was he wasn't addicted to gambling he was addicted to winning you know well, well and it yeah it, it it feels good and the way that robin hood has set up the app and the simulated returns and yeah. they, they they just have a lot of tools that um you, you know you find a, a a cheap option and it it makes you feel really good so um trying to like i have a lot of 
calls that are expiring 2026 on SoFi, Palantir, and Robinhood. Um, and I'm trying to find that balance because the way that I found I learned best with options, I've, I can read all day long on them and none of it sticks. If I throw a thousand to an option, I will learn more about studying where that option is going and how it's moving in the alpha and the beta on it. Um, but I don't want to get myself into a space where I feel I'm marginalizing the success that I've had um, by doing shorter and shorter term option strategies. Right now, like I, I, I timed the, the Tesla fall really well and I have some short options that expire May 17th on um, Robinhood, SoFi, and Palantir. Um, and I feel like I've done a lot of due diligence on where they're at. I got like $23 calls on Palantir um, and they're in the money and they should, they should print. But so what is I your question? What, what is your question? I guess I'm having a hard time uh, balancing my portfolio and not getting so heavy into the option side because the reward is there um, and playing the long term 10 year bigger picture that I have on a lot of these companies. Segregate your account, keep an options account specifically mm -hmm. just for options. The rest of your money, put it into your your more stock long term, and about ninety to ninety five percent should be in stock. The rest you can play around with options to get really comfortable. But don't don't look at them both at the same time because otherwise that'll that'll freak you out a little bit. So options, I would say, to get your dopamine hits, keep it in a segregated account. The other ones you can you can just longer term. The, the problem is what happens if as everything is in the same account, what you're going to see is the dopamine hit. And then you're going to say, well, maybe I'll just sell some shares and buy options instead. Oh, maybe I'll just sell more shares and buy options instead. And then what ends up happening is before you know it, 50% of your portfolio is options. So segregate the accounts, keep them separate. That's all. Okay. The other thing that I, I want to point out too, Thomas, this is, you, this is great to have both you and Landon because you're like, you know, 10 years apart, basically. Yeah. You see, you can see the more money, more problems. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But this is this is this is good because this is where you're starting, and you'll probably be somewhere, uh, hopefully, uh, where Landon is. I, I think Chris is right. I think, especially with this little condition that you have, where you're seeking the dopamine, you can lose all your money, man. You can lose all your money if you keep trying to leverage your way up and up and up. You've made a, a bunch of money. You you, you have to uh, be comfortable in your wins. You know, I don't know if you had had planned to have this much money at the age that you're at, but like. Figure out how to now make some of this money work for you, right? Maybe instead of maybe instead of uh, buying all these options, maybe you want to start selling some of these options against against your and start generating money that way. So at least at least you become the house, and the, and the odds are in your favor, right? So maybe not as much money to be made, but it's a little bit safer. You have to manage that part of yourself because, uh, especially when the numbers get really big, you can you know you you can make some mistakes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I also think I, I run all your trades by Thomas. If he approves, then <laughs> I also would just I, I, I would have to sign off on these, and you're on the hook for fifty percent of the wins and losses. <laughs> out of the options, so uh, out of the options, how many of them are in twenty twenty six, and what percentage of them are expiring like in the next couple months? Uh, this year, I have about fifty percent of them expiring. Uh, only about ten percent are expiring in the next like two months. That are like less than 60 day options. And what percentage of your portfolio would you say is in options versus shares? Uh, maybe we're like 15 to 18%. Oh, I, I thought it was way more than that. The way you so, make Hold on. So, so 85% is in stock. 15% mm -hmm. is yeah. in options. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I, I mean, that's not a bad, that's not a bad ratio to be honest. Just know one thing when it comes to options, there are, and this is the thing that I tell most people, try not to do short dated options mm -hmm. only because it doesn't give you a lot of flexibility and time. Yeah. And there's a lot of times where your thesis on a company could be 100% spot on, but then like the ma macroeconomic challenges that could come can wipe you out. And the the thing is you're time constrained, right? So be careful with that. If you're going to do options, mm -hmm. most people, I just say, 
leaps are the way to go. Leaps have the most probability of being mispriced relative to the returns that you could possibly get. But you'd have to end up, you'd really have to be careful and do them on a you have to do them on an individual level, you know. So that's my only thing. We're gonna learn some stuff about options tomorrow morning, right, Amit? <laughs> are we? Oh no, because oh, so what I'm doing with TJ. Uh, we're doing a fun thing. Yeah. Those, he's the guy. Just no, so, this, so me and TJ do a podcast. He he texted me. He wants to do this segment. So he's giving oh, me. It's not, it's not a guarantee. I thought that was what I thought. I misunderstood. I thought that it was a live stream event. No, it's a live stream. It's a live stream. It's a live stream. It's, okay. it's We do a podcast every week. But basically, for those that want to check out my channel tomorrow, me and TJ. TJ manages like 5 million bucks, personally. He's giving me 200,000, giving meaning. He's saying, hey, Amit, give me a couple stocks. And then he's going to simulate, all right, if I picked a Celsius and I ran the wheel on it, what would that look like? And then if he likes the premiums and and we're going to do this live, he might, you know, sell some covered calls live or some puts or whatever. So wait, so he's actually going to have real money behind this? Yes, but he has to like the premium. Well, it's not about him actually investing it. It's about him showing the process of, hey, Amit wants to write puts on Celsius. I'm just throwing it out there. What would the premiums look like? So showing people how to set it up. And then if he actually likes it, he's going to do it. But you know, it's up to him. Have point. you picked a company yet? I've got to do some research tonight. He said to come with three companies. I I was actually going to talk to you. I don't. I have a couple in mind, but you know, I don't know. Okay. It's up to him. He has to look at the premium because sometimes a company's good. But like Celsius is a good company, but are the premiums worth it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, there might not even be enough liquidity to do what he's trying to do. So. Yeah, but that so that's the point. Like if I say Celsius and he looks at the options, he's like, dude, it's like two hundred contracts. I can't write this contract. That would be a teaching lesson in the podcast to show people mm -hmm. if you're trying to write cash card puts you can't do it on something not liquid right yeah it'll be good it'll be a fun one hmm. yeah. all right cool thank you landon and thomas this was super fun thank you for uh watching every every week it really means a lot to us it's awesome yep have a great night you guys. take yep. care guys bye guys all right see you guys this is the last one for the week right yep we'll be back on monday keep going from there yep. anything fun this week take care boys I'm not doing anything this weekend. No, I think I'm just gonna no. chill out too. I am in contract with my condo in New York. Oh, so oh, you yeah. got it sold. Good shit. Yeah, yeah. It, oh, you got it sold. Dump, oh, that's great. Yep. Yeah. I'm gonna dump all the proceeds into commercial real estate. I was about to say, where are you putting this money, dude? Yeah. What are you gonna do? Hey, listen, it's fixed income. I just get to chill. I get money. I get capital appreciation. I'll take it all day, every hey, day. What if you? What if you take all that money? We buy Palantir. Mm -hmm. and we come back in. The community says, "Come back." No, and you're like, no, guys, about fifty thousand shares of Palantir. Like, you just drop that. Nah, dude. I'm good. I'm real good. I'm super good. <laughs> no, thank you. Yes. Okay, so hold on. Let's do this live. What what company should I should I off the top of your head? What do I recommend to TJ tomorrow? I was thinking of Celsius to be honest, because it sold off a lot, and like a hundred dollars by twenty twenty two. Here's not. here's the thing: the volatility on Celsius is good enough to the point where you could theoretically run a wheel on it and the valuation in my opinion should be closer to a hundred, but that's I by agree. 2026. So it's going to be a while. Like I said, I'm not a wheel and deal guy, so I couldn't yeah. tell you I'm not short term and short term options in nature. So I couldn't tell you. And not to mention Celsius is not as retail heavy either. As far as from what I can tell, you know, like if you look at a lot of retail investors, Palantir, SoFi, all these other things, they have they have a lot of liquidity. Tesla is a good. What one. about Amazon? I think, Do you think Amazon would be? Eh, good? Amazon would be wheel? good too. Amazon could be too. I think the wheel. To be honest, the wheel should be run on Tesla. Tesla already you doing wheel that. And deal. Yeah, he's already. Well, doing that. that's because he knows the premiums have the premium are are not what they used to be. Basically, yeah. find all the companies that you see all these retail people being stupid in. And, and use them. Because look, TJ's entire strategy is based on one fundamental fact, that people are buying and s buying really stupid contracts and he's letting them expire worthless. Yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. he's doing that both on the call mm -hmm. side and the put side. So yeah. you need to think of it as who am I competing against? If you're trying to compete against, you know, in a very low beta stock, you're not going to find a lot of good premiums. If you're going to like mag seven kind of stocks, you're not going to find a lot of like dumb money in there. Dumb money typically resides on the sofas and the palantirs of the world. So, you know, just putting it out there. I just looked up real quick that the most, like the hundred most volatile stocks, because that's typically what you want. I don't even know any of these. Well, I know some. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know any of these, but this is what you want. You know I mean? That's what Nickel well, wants. You want I'd, fundamental I'd, companies, though. You want a good company. I'd say, I'd say volatile. But if you at least Look want at... inherent volatility, then you want to find that. But, but if you're assigned the shares, you got to have something you believe well, in. For, for a put. So, or, so. But, 
three the three things that I would recommend you do. Number one, it should be large cap, large or medium cap. So, you know, this way you're not dealing with some small cap, low volume bullshit things. So that's number one. You should have medium to large cap. Um, next, it should have a good amount of retail frenzy that buys. And believe it or not, Celsius is starting to pick up a lot of retail that is willing to pay really stupid prices. So that that could be a consideration, you know, especially when you have these post run ups. So Celsius is a good one. Um, think of he's already doing ones. PayPal. He's already doing Enphase. He's already doing Google. Say, yeah. Google is another one to do. Also, Google could work. Google has a lot of liquidity. Google, you know, that fundamentally is still a gener cash flow generator. I was thinking Google and Amazon are not horrible. You know what, I would actually yeah. look, look at Apple too. From what I've seen, the stocks that are between 100 and 200 bucks have great prices. Like I, when, I, when I was looking at um, starting to sell options, I mean, Coinbase, look at Coinbase right now. Coinbase has some really good, really good prices on options because yeah, well, of if Bitcoin. Bitcoin's so volatile for that. I know, but that, but this is where you get the, this is where you get the gains. Nah, man, Bitcoin you don't want does, that though. You don't want to get assigned the shares, dude. Oh, no, 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 but I'm not saying to buy puts. So we're talking about buying puts. I'm talking about saying if you want to buy, buy call options. Depends no, on no, he doesn't buy. If he if he sells calls, he has to buy 100 shares just to sell the call. You he, know what I mean? Like he I, think, I think what, what what listen to what all covered calls. Look at what Futbucker said. High volatility compared to historical uh, stuff, not just I, high IV. That's absolutely right. That's mm. true. Yeah, you know? that's true. Anyway, yeah. what about Snowflake, Chris? You think right. Snowflake is a good wheel? No. No, I don't think so either. I don't think either. No. All right. You, if you look at the contracts, you, I mean, you look at the open interest, right? You want to have something that has a good amount of liquidity so you can move in and out of the position, I suppose. Coinbase. Um, Coin, yeah, dude, Coinbase, Coinbase is, is, if Bitcoin crashes, TJ does not want to be stuck with hundreds of thousands of dollars of Coinbase. No, you that's don't. But if you're buying them to sell options against them, Right, if that's what you're looking to do, I mean, Carlos is technically right. The premiums are super juicy, no, but, but, but you but have to own the shares, which is the problem. But you're, if you're you buying have, them to sell options. If you're selling options, you have to hold the underlying shares anyway. And what I'm saying is, with with what's what and crazy is going to happen this year with with crypto up or down. There's a lot of vo volatility that's coming, and yeah, that's, I, I don't right. want to recommend that one though, because if I'm wrong, like I don't want him to get into Coinbase. Well, he's not going. Time. Look, it's a it, this is a test, right? This is yeah. a. Uh, but no, if he if he might see juicy premiums, but I dude, would never I, run the wheel on Coinbase. I spoke to him about it. I spoke to him about it, and I told him that the two stocks that I want to do are Enphase and Coinbase. And I didn't pick those because I love those stocks. I picked those because when I'm looking out at the premiums, you're getting 12, 13 bucks a fucking share for these things. Yeah, but you're getting it for a reason, dude. Enphase okay, has been you're selling for a year, and Coinbase people think will be fucked once Bitcoin's about. Like, there's right. a reason. But I'm that. saying selling covered calls, right? So you you you're buying the shares. You're selling covered calls, 20, 25 percent out of the money. If you're at any risk of getting called out, you, ro you either you know, roll it out or you close it early. That, that's yeah. that's the point. It's yeah. just about making money, right? And what I've noticed is Coinbase and Enphase have those nice over ten dollar premiums because they're that nice sweet spot, and there there's some good options. But also, dude, no, you're problems. right. You also don't want something that's like the reason he loves wheeling SoFi is because it's stuck between six and eight. Yeah. So he's yeah. it's very predictable. Yeah. Coinbase yeah. can go down ten percent, you know, tomorrow. Sure. Or but up. if you're selling, but if you're selling the covered, this is what I'm saying. If you're selling the covered calls, okay, fine. Then you keep you keep on. But eventually, it's gonna have to settle down. I just I, I don't know. For me, those were the two stocks. And the moment I get maybe even next week, once I start getting some of that some of that Bitcoin liquidity, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. And phase Coinbase. People are saying, does he ever? Me. Does he ever do any? Um... Does he ever do any iron condors? I, I've never seen him do it. I'm pretty sure he knows what it is, but I don't I think he does him. those. I don't think okay. he, he does. He does basic cash card puts and covered calls. That's it. Very All simple. right. Sometime next week, Futbucker, come on. We'll talk options well. Too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's get Futbucker on and we'll do a whole option. All right. Uh, any, um, any earnings on Monday? We got banks tomorrow. We got to look at these fucking banks tomorrow. Banks, and banks. I'll cover that tomorrow. The market is coming guys. out already, man. All right. But Netflix Later. and Tesla next week, dude. It's starting. Is yeah. it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there we go. All right, guys. We'll see you on Monday. <clears throat> Have a good weekend, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye, guys. Hit like, subscribe, all that jazz. Follow us on Twitter. Bye. Bye.